The Prince by Niccolo Machiavelli. Read by Ian Richardson. You must know there are two ways of contending, the one by law, the other by force. The first method is natural to man, the second to beasts. But because the first is frequently insufficient, it is essential to have recourse to the second. Therefore it is necessary for a prince to understand how to take advantage of the beast and the man. Princes have learnt this from the classical writers who describe how Achilles and many other ancient princes were given to the centaur, Chiron, to train in his own discipline, which means that, as they had for teacher a half-beast and half-man, so a prince learned how to make use of both natures, and that he cannot survive with one and not the other. He who is the cause of another becoming powerful is himself ruined. Because that predominancy has been brought about either by cunning or by force, both are distrusted by the one who has been brought to power. The wish to acquire is, in truth, very natural and common, and men always do so when they can, and for this they will be praised, not blamed. But when they cannot do so, yet wish to do so by any means, then there is folly and blame. Nothing disappears so rapidly as generosity, for even whilst you exercise it, you are losing the ability to do so, and so become either poor or despised, or else, in avoiding poverty, avaricious and hated. And above all things, a prince should guard himself against being despised and hated. And generosity leads to both. Therefore, it is wiser to have a reputation for meanness, which brings disapproval without hatred, than to be compelled through seeking a reputation for generosity to incur a name for avarice, which brings both disapproval and hatred. On this a question arises, whether it is better to be loved than feared, or feared than loved. It may be answered that one should wish to be both, but because it is difficult to unite them in one person, it is much safer to be feared than loved if you cannot be both, since in general men are ungrateful, fickle, cowardly, and avaricious. But as long as you are successful, they are yours entirely. They will shed blood for you, risk their property, life and children when the danger is remote. But when it is close, they will turn against you. And the prince, who, relying entirely on their promises, takes no other precautions, is ruined. Because friendships that are bought, rather than achieved by greatness or nobility of mind, may indeed be earned, but are not long-lasting, and in time of crisis cannot be relied upon. And men have less scruples in offending one who is loved than one who is feared. For love is preserved by a bond which, due to the failings of men, is broken at every opportunity to their advantage. But fear is strengthened by the dread of punishment, which is always effective. Nevertheless, a prince ought to inspire fear in such a way that if he is not loved, at least he avoids hatred because he can survive very well being feared and not hated, and this will continue as long as he leaves alone the property of his people and their women. But when it is necessary for him to execute someone, he must do it with proper justification and manifest reason, and above all he must keep his hands off the property of others, 
because men more quickly forget the death of their father than the loss of the inheritance. Besides, pretexts for confiscating property are always available. A wise prince cannot, nor should he, keep his promise if it proves to be a disadvantage and when the circumstances that gave rise to that promise no longer exist. If all men were good, this precept would not hold. But because they are bad and will not keep faith with you, you too are not bound to keep your promises to them. A prince is also much respected when he is either a true friend or a downright enemy. In other words, when he declares himself without any reservation in favor of one party against the other. This will always be more favorable than remaining neutral. If one is on the spot, disorders are seen as they spring up, and one can quickly deal with them. But if one is not at hand, they are heard of only when they have become serious, and by then it is too late. The blunder ought never to be perpetrated to avoid war because it is not to be avoided, only deferred to your disadvantage. One has to mention that men should either be well treated or crushed, because although they can avenge themselves of lighter injuries, of more serious ones they cannot. Therefore, the harm that is done to a man should be so serious that one does not stand in fear of revenge.